narrated by independent writer Claudia Casales and producer Ellen Letourneau, Bread and Beauty, A Year in Montgomery County's Agricultural Reserve, is an exquisite book, and it showcases the 93,000-acre agricultural reserve in Maryland. It's a nationally recognized model of farmland and open space preservation. Now, isn't, this is right. our thing, Nancy. It is. And a thriving, diverse place. And uh, as you know, on, on Big Blend Radio here, we always like to talk about uh, preservation and how land is taken care of, managed, and how it can be uh, good for people and for the planet. And this book really showcases the story of this region. And it has over 120 recipes um, that are going to make you very, very hungry. And it really from the region. And uh, also the book uh, covers the historic foodways, even canals. There's stories of canals in there. Um, it's just beautiful. It makes you want to go out that, to that region, which we have not discovered yet. Uh, we will get there on our Love Your Parks tour soon. So we're excited to have Claudia and Ellen join us on Big Blend Radio today. And I encourage you to go to their website, breadandbeauty.org, and that's where you can get the book as well and also see a sampling of, of what the book look, looks like. And uh, you're going to want to go there and you're going to want to eat and cook. <laughs> so welcome, Mia. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you today. We are so excited to have you both here. And Ellen, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm wonderful. Good hey, to talk to you. This is this is such an exciting book and project because um, the net proceeds from the book benefit Montgomery Countryside Alliance and Mana Food Center. I know that they're featured in the book as well. Um, Claudia, do you want to tell us a little bit about who Montgomery Countryside Alliance is? Um, sure. They're a citizens group. Ellen, you should chime in if I get anything wrong. They're a citizens group out in the reserve that is dedicated to um, helping uh, ensure that the reserve stays the way it is, open space and farms. And even though it's zoned and there are easements on the land to keep it uh, agricultural and open, there are always threats. We're in Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of demand for land and development. So MCA, the Montgomery Countryside Alliance, works to, um, you know, they keep track of politics and policy to make sure that the reserve can continue to function and exist. Oh, excellent. Cool. Excellent. Ellen, how did this project come to be, uh, you know, uh, Bread and Beauty? Uh, what led you to put the book together? Well, I moved to the Agricultural Reserve about a little over six years ago from the Detroit area, and oh, wow. I found myself in this gorgeous place, and I was very curious about uh, what it was all about. I hadn't lived in the country before. Uh, I'd lived in urban and suburban settings, but not in a rural setting. Uh, but it was fascinating. It was so close to, uh, you know, the, to our nation's capital, just, just uh, mm. about 30 miles away. And I kind of devoted myself to, uh, to learning what it was about, to meeting the people, to understanding farming a little bit better. It led me to um, work on a, um, a council campaign for a, someone who was running for a council seat in the county, and then that led me to work for Mont Montgomery Countryside Alliance, the nonprofit that, that you've just discussed, to mm -hmm. help um, do outreach and volunteer coordination for them and set up their events. And through that, I met Claudia, and we had discussed how do we continue to try and tell people in this region, many of whom don't know the wonderful gem that is in their backyard, about it, uh, to raise awareness about it. And Claudia thought, how about a cookbook? That would be a great <laughs> way mm. to bring people to the reserve and the reserve to people and talk about things like uh, farmland preservation and zoning, but as Claudia likes to say, zucchinis may be more fun than zoning, so <laughs> it seems like a, a, a natural way to bring people to the table to discuss these kinds of issues. I know, and there's beer like involved, it. too. You've got breweries out there. You've got bees and lavender. I mean, there's, it, the diversity is so exciting. Nancy and I, as we travel on our Love Your Parks tour, we've gone to a number of agricultural regions, and some need help in regards to what's happening with the soil. And one of the recent areas we went to is San Benito County. It's up in central California, right outside Pinnacles National Park. Very historic ranching community, uh, cattle. Um, now they're doing olive oil. There's wines, incredible Pinot Noirs. Um, just a, an amazing uh, scene, that's a farm-to-table scene that's really cropped up. And there's all these different um, 
kinds of farms. So some are doing squash and they do like a maze for the kids and during, you know, Halloween time and all that good stuff. But what we also found out, we went to a ranch called Piscinus Ranch and they're doing lamb and they're really working on uh, taking care of the land and, and kind of, you know, revitalizing it. And they were saying that you know, even if you're an organic farm, if you're too big, and you don't take care of the soil, it doesn't really matter with whether you're organic or not. And from reading, uh, you know, uh, Bread and Beauty and looking at the pictures and seeing all this diversity, to me it seems like um, that lesson has also been learned there in the reserve that uh, diversity in crops and in livestock is a, is a beneficial thing. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of the stories that we have in here is called um, don't call it dirt because someone, one of the farmers said to us, you know, dirt is what you're trying to get rid of out of your house. Mm. But soil, you know, he said, call it soil because that is the source of everything we do. And every mm. farmer that we talk to, uh, you know, they might have different ways of dealing with their soil, of dealing with the quality of the earth, but they all recognize that that's the basis, and if their soil is no good, their crops are no good, and their business is no good. And so um, that is something that is really important to all of them out there. Mm. It's, it's, it's really amazing to me looking at the book at how beautiful the landscape is and so pastoral and, and natural, and everyone looks healthy and happy. And, you know, I would never have thought of this right outside D.C. Our good exactly. Adam Roberts, who's yeah. been on our shows for over 10, 11 years now, and he introduced us to, hi, Adam from Bethesda Green, and he's out there in, in, in that area, too. And, and when he came on the show talking about, you know, the D.C. area and all these places, I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, when I think of D.C., I don't see anything buildings. but a bunch of white buildings yeah, in my mind because we haven't been there yet. So. <laughs> So your book really kind of put this into perspective. Like, wow, where is this? Yeah, of what what you have to offer out there beyond you know uh, very historic you know monuments and like the you know the National Mall and all of that. It, it to me it, it's you really gave us this other uh, perspective as travelers. I want to go because I want to go eat all the food over there and drink the beer. <laughs> So, well, yeah. you know, it's interesting that you say that because this was actually established back in the 1980s. And, you know, um, one of the, the planning board chairman at the time, Royce Hansen, who is a noted uh, planner, he's written many books, and, and he made the point that there's room to do both of these things in this county. And it was a real step forward, recognizing that, um, you know, it's not just about development. It's the, the Ag Reserve provides jobs and tax revenue. It protects the water resources, habitat. Mm. And so, you know, seeing the value in that was a really Im important step forward for the county. Mm. I, and also the like history that. because, uh, you know, farming is, you know, historic. And you've got, you know, stories of history of people, other people, uh, recipes from the past, farms of the past, but also underground railroad history out there. Ellen, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, there's. it's just such a, um, a rich and diverse place and has been over the years. You know, many, many changes and people uh, have have moved through this area. And um, there's a, uh, a gentleman, uh, Anthony Cohn, that started Monero Foundation mm -hmm. and Button Farm Living History Center. And he he, they have heirloom crops. They uh, have a garden that looks as if it um, was planted with the types of vegetables you would find on a um, on a in a in a plantation um, during the um, during the Civil War. And he brings people in and tries to give them an immersive um, experience. And and he's um, he's a historian, and um, he helped. Um, Oprah prepare for her role in Beloved. Um, he brought her out there, and he could kind of really give her that kind of, um, it, you know, transporting experience. And he tries to do that um, uh, for people who visit his place and keep that keep that alive and and mm. tell those stories, those important stories. And there, there's also yeah. the story. There's one lady uh, uh, who comes in from Zimbabwe. And, of course, you know, Nancy and I, in our history of living in Africa, I'm like, oh, and bringing in the different crops and different ideas, and yet she's, what, doing five acres. And that was like I was thinking about how much acreage 
I mean, she's out there going and, and, you know, farming, you know, by hand, basically. And it's like, so does, is that the typical size of a farm? Everyone's got a little bit, they're all doing something different, but it seems like a different sizes. Yeah. I think Go that's ahead. the interesting thing about the diversity. It's not only, um, you know, the different kinds of people. There, there are women out there. There are people like Tanya from other countries. And um, there are older, you know, family farms that are doing commodity crops. And and I think when you have that kind of um, diversity, it, it can serve so many different people in so many different ways. And, you know, some people are farming, some people are doing history, some people have, um, you know, uh, kind of like camp and entertainment businesses out there. And that's, you know, that's part of that diversity just because you have all that land in one place. There's yeah, and Montgomery cool. Countryside Alliance has been help. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, no, Montgomery ahead, Countryside Alliance has w- worked to help link. Um, Tanya Spondolo is one of the women who was linked mm-hmm. with a um, a landowner so that she right. could farm on a smaller scale. Uh, the one of the um, the challenges to new farmers is the cost of land, as you can imagine, in this region. Mm-hmm. So uh, the alliance and others work at at bringing people together who might not be able to purchase land but could lease it and um, and farm either on a part-time or full-time basis on smaller parcels mm-hmm. and work in a partnership with the landowner, which is really nice. And then there are large, as Claudia was saying, you know, very larger um, family farms that are several hundred acres. And many of the commodity farmers, uh, the grain farmers, lease other people's lands to uh, to do their crops because scale is important to the work that they do. Wow, how many how many varieties of crops do you think are grown out there? Because I mean, it seems like oh there's my. everything from plums and peaches to, you know, like heirloom tomatoes, and I mean, it's just it's so you beautiful. really can fill your table. I mean, I think that's sort of what we discovered. You know, there's, um, you know, there are uh, livestock farmers and produce farmers, um, and there's there is a little bit of dairy out there. But um, you you really can fill the table. In fact, um, one of the farmers out there does, is a shepherd, and she does um, you know mostly for wool, but she also does lambs. You know she has to cull her flock. And Ellen and I had a um, a sit down with her one afternoon to talk about mutton and how wonderful mutton is. And she wanted to be sure we had some mutton recipes in this book. And um, I know I, people laugh, but I'm telling you, it was the most wonderful thing I've ever had. It was just like a giant lamb chop. <laughs> like what's wrong with that? So you know, I it, think it, that's part of it. It's interesting because you're know, having that diversity and then you have what four chefs, in local chefs, right? Even Chef Andres, uh, Jose Andres, he's an amazing man. Um, what he's been doing in, in the food movement of the world and, and helping people as well, you know, doing all kinds of amazing things. Um, but tell oh, us about, yeah. yeah, who who helped with all these recipes? Because I know we're featuring uh, the upside down plum cake, not a pineapple cake, everyone. Upside down plum cake, <laughs> and it's in a skillet. And I just thought, well, this is unique and different. And, you know, really talks about summer, so you guys have plums out there, too. You know, speak about diversity. That's really interesting because, I, in my mind, I always thought it was kind of a chilly place. And I think of snow, not plum cakes and and all these green crops. And I I don't know. And and there's Bloody Mary recipes in there, too, by the way. I'm I'm (laughs) down to that. I'll I'll, I'll make it. I know. But uh, but, when I look at... um, the the recipes, I mean, these are diverse as they can go. I mean, but then you've got like whipped cream that you can use on all kinds of recipes in there. So who helped come up with all of them? Cool. Well, both of us are CSA members, Community Supported Agriculture, where you pay a farmer up front, and then during the season you get your food deliveries, um, you know, every week or every two weeks. And so we just had a ball looking at what was being delivered and figuring out what we, you know, how we wanted to eat it. And so 
Um, a lot of it came from our local farmers being inspired by the produce. But Ellen, you know, you um, can, you know, uh, the guy at Watershed really well, Ben, and we had a bunch of local chefs helping us too. Yeah, we tried to elevate um, some of the vegetables that you might receive from a CSA or you might want to experiment at a farmer's market, but you're not quite sure what to do with a kohlrabi or Mm -hmm. um, you're not familiar with parsnips or, you know, some of the – or even Swiss chard that that – that we wanted to say that there's such abundance and variety as we've been talking about. We just wanted to to give people um, uh, some tools to to experiment with those and, and enjoy them. And I think we all would agree that uh, fresh <laughs> local produce it's it's a revelation. I mean, some of them things you don't have to do a whole lot to, to right. make them delicious. They they just are. You can eat them fresh, and they require cool very to... little handling. It's it's really cool that you have recipes in there because you've gone full circle with it. Mm-hmm. Like here's a picture of the fields, and then people are like, oh wow, they have that. Oh, I didn't know mm-hmm. that. And then here's the <laughs> recipe. You're like, oh, look at that. Also, oh, that's where it came from, and now I'm eating it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cool. Now mm-hmm. I've got a special question for you because, um, Ellen, I know that you get into you know special events as well, but each of you are going to throw a little picnic party on a farm. Or a piece of land there because it also got nature, right? So I want to know, where are you going to throw this party? You're going to invite like three to five people. So we want to know who's coming <laughs> to the table. Anybody, and you can invite anyone alive, passed on, and maybe the farmers, you know, anybody. Who's coming, but what are you serving that is locally produced? That's important. And, of course, we want to know about the wine or, you know, if it's going to be the beer or the Bloody Marys. <laughs> What's going on there? So let's start with you, Ellen. A nice summer oh, summertime boy. picnic. I know. Yeah, because you got well, really good recipes in there. Yeah, there's um. Well, so I hearken to uh, either well summer, spring, or fall. Um, maybe a crisp uh, and cool evening at Shepherd's Hay Farm, and we have some um, some mutton and lamb chops on the grill. In the um, it's in the shadow of Sugarloaf Mountain, and there's a winery right around the corner called Sugarloaf uh, Mountain Vineyard, and we have a recipe for, help me, Claudia. I, um, what is the? <laughs> for, <laughs> I know. I'm going to have a great wine selection. I'm, right? I'm, I'm getting stumped. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I've, we stared at this book for four years now, and uh, and I can't bring everything top to mind. But let's see, what else would we have? We'd just probably have um, a light salad of all of the lovely uh, vegetables and some sourdough bread. We have a recipe in there for the reserved sourdough with a starter that's been Mm -hmm. handed down through three generations and and maybe Mm. some dried Concord grapes right from Shepherd's Hay and and some goat cheese from a goat uh, place, Cherry Glen Goat Farm, right around the corner. Wow. Gosh, me and wow. definitely Claudia's upside down cake. Oh yeah, we we need <laughs> that. Is that your that's your cake, the plums? That's that's your upside down cake? Yeah, yeah, we came up with that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I cool. I've got a good choice there. You know, it's interesting too. You know, you've got all these different recipes, but some of the salads, <clears throat> I'm telling you that one with the potatoes, the new potatoes, and then there's the kale, the kale salad in there. I'm like, you know, you made kale look good because <laughs> a lot of people oh, run good. <laughs> Some of us run I'm from glad it, to you know. Hear that. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it's hard to get excited about kale, but the buttermilk really makes it tangy and tender. It's a good. Mm. I think it is a good. Um, it's a good one. <laughs> Ellen, who's coming to your party? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Well, one of the the um, the local residents, the sheep. Um, they're right on the farm are really great. <laughs> I think that they, <laughs> even though we're serving them, they're very sweet in the backdrop and they provide gorgeous wool and and um, so we might have some blankets made from some local wool. But who's coming? Well, of course I have to have Claudia there and um, the shepherdess, the shepherdess Lee Langstaff and um, Brian Patterson, who's been who's now working at a museum and started a cafe, and he just has a uh, he's he's delightful, um, uh, and and he could do some cooking as well. I'm trying to think of 
Yeah. Mm. Do you think it, any the, local musicians to play? Chef, we, we need. You know. oh, yeah, invite the chef. <laughs> you know, and then and then the music. I mean, to me, there's something musical about this. I, I can't even. I don't know. This area seems to me like like an art community. Like you know, it to me, is. I just see like art and music there. And yeah, totally I mean, we could find my mind. Oh, I know. I know who. How about this, Claudia? We uh, have histor- uh, medley district singers. They're a cappella group of um, women, and um, they are farmers by day and um, have these have gorgeous, gorgeous voices. And um, and that's wow. really oh, maybe maybe a little um, one of the one of the gals plays the guitar. And then they have small, um, old-fashioned percussion, percussion instruments, and and cool. they just use their hands to clap. It's very um, folksy and evocative, and and lovely, and wow. and their harmonies are just beautiful. So I think that yeah, some music is always nicely. good out there. And I I like that. I like that. So now, Claudio, um, where are you having your party? <laughs> I um I want uh to invite you guys to come to a picnic along the canal which Ooh, is cool. a national park. You should make it part of your tour. Um it Ooh, was okay. one of the country's first um uh infrastructure projects. It was designed to get um uh, cr- uh crops from the west into the east and ship them out through Baltimore and Georgetown. So anyway, I think you all should come to that. And okay, I think cool. I would serve a kitchen garden aioli. I really love mm. this recipe. It's mm. really fun with a lot of people. And it um, it's a garlicky mayonnaise that you make up. And then you just have all the great produce that happens to be in season. And you just sit around and drink some lovely rosé wine from Rockland. Okay. Anna's, mm. Anna's rosé is, is an excellent accompaniment to this. And um, you know you can have some local, some fresh farm hard-boiled eggs, some chicken, mm-hmm. some cold chicken, potatoes, green beans, cucumbers, red peppers, green peppers, whatever is available. Oof. And you know you just kind of sit there and di- and you know what we would need is some of Ellen's excellent sourdough bread, and we Yummy. would just sit there all afternoon and dip and eat garlic and drink wine and have a nice time on the canal. Ooh, that we sounds eat oh, really good. I love this. And there's canal <laughs> recipes in here too, which I think is, I love, I, I love waterways and things and canals. Mm-hmm. And, Cause I mean, here where we are in Yuma, there's Arizona canals. today, yes, there's canals and we go walking in the mornings along the canals and you see all these oh. different birds hang out. Here we have the Colorado river and then there's canal running with a little bit of reforested area with cottonwoods in between. And the bird life changes uh-huh. from canal to the river. It's, it's really bizarre. It's like they get the still <laughs> and the kill deer in the canals. And sometimes there's burrowing owls and everything out there. So the the canals to me are interesting how, you know, we can coexist. Yeah, you know, the funny thing about um, it's it's the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, the C&L Canal, and it, it um, was started in the early 1800s, and it was never able to compete with the railroads. It was always getting flooded out during the Civil War. It was a real target, as you can imagine, as a transportation resource. And it just was never able to compete with the railroad. But it had a good run as a business. I think finally in the 1920s it got wiped out by a flood. And it just kind of sat there fallow. Nobody really knew what to do with it. Um, And then in the 50s uh, someone had the idea, you know, the area was growing, Someone had the idea that um, we should build a highway on top of it. You know, the land is already there. It was already cleared, and it was heading in the direction it we, people needed to go. But um, you may know that Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas um, thought this was a terrible idea, and he took a Washington Post reporter with him on a hike, and they hiked the entire length of the canal. It's about 200 miles. And, Whoa. you know, the reporter wrote all these stories about it and made it, you know, it sort of became a thing. And eventually, um, you know, people got to see what an amazing combination of nature and um, human-made construction this was. And it was transferred to the National Park Service and is now um, a national park. And you, everybody, you know, wow. you see kayakers, canoers, cyclists, wow. Boy Scout troops. 
you know, they they sort of take it on as a challenge. It's a really, really wonderful resource for the county. And I'm on my way. For the okay. region. <laughs> That's it. We're yeah, packing the park. Your <laughs> canal must be a lot wider than the canals. Yeah, here are these here. little irrigation canals. I mean, yeah. they're not little because when I start to look over, I already get that, uh, you know, vertigo feeling. And <laughs> I'm but, like, dude, I'm going down. <laughs> but, but the, you know, I, I have read about this canal and, 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 We've actually done things on this. Now mm-hmm. that I go back, you know, it's just oh. when we do so many stories, you get to this, like, okay, who's where? And the only way is to go to the place. Mm-hmm. You really, when, once you go to a place, it gets in, you get the, you get the soil under your fingernails, you know. And you don't forget. And then mm-hmm. that's it. You're, you're in. Yeah. You're in. See what happened to two, the two <laughs> of you? <laughs> yeah, you're exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What a, and that's what a kind cool of what we want people to do is get out there and experience experience this so that they'll get in too yeah and i think this is a really good example um number one of a reserve and how all these different puzzle pieces come together and it's so it's it's united you know um and also with what you're doing with the book uh bread and beauty i think um is to me it's, it's an important thing in regards to a way to connect people you said about you know let's do it with food and recipes, and mm-hmm. I think that's really important. Smart. It does bring people around the table, mm-hmm. and they do see the beauty, and they start to also respect uh, their farmers and where their food mm-hmm. comes from because so many of us are going to a grocery store, and, the, and you know, now we have to scan vegetables, and the machine goes, you just put a mango in your bag. Yeah, put your <laughs> mango <laughs> in the bag. And then half the people in the stores don't even know what they're selling. So it's this is a very educational, fun, delicious, and beautiful experience, and I think it's a project that um, could be replicated across the country, quite frankly, the whole thing. Yeah, I think, you know, when you start linking food and history and the land, you really, you're going to find good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it shows, you know, that we can coexist because there's always this mentality in a lot of the places where we talked and did seminars on tourism. People had the idea it was either all tourism or all business that was not tourism, Mm. either or. And the main thing we were trying to say was, how about and? Get rid of the either or. <laughs> How about and? Mm-hmm. So you can do both. You just have to look at what each side needs mm-hmm. and make sure you accommodate properly for all that, that it's sustainable. And balance, yeah. yeah. Balance. In, in other words, you have to think. <laughs> yeah. Cla- Claudia, tell me about the photographers. Because one of them oh, well, we were... shares your, your last name there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we were very lucky to have, this is like an, this really is an almost entirely local project. Um, Our stylist um, is is a a young woman who lives out in the reserve, and she helped us set up some of these photos. But our our photographers are also local. Martin Radigan uh, does beautiful, Mm. beautiful portraits and um, nature photography. And um, so, you know, like that double rainbow on the cover, there's no Photoshopping in this book. He, you know, he was out there and he catches these beautiful moments and this beautiful light. And, you know, when the storm is rolling in, he jumps in his car and, you know, gets out there to catch the clouds and the sun, sun, sunset and sunrise. So we were very lucky to have him because um, Ellen said right from the beginning, um, you know, it's a beautiful place. It needs to be a beautiful book. And um, he helped us a great deal to achieve that. And then, mm. yeah, you're right. The other photographer is uh, my husband, George Kusilis, and he is, um, he's a published photographer as well. Um, he did a book on Washington, D.C., and, of course, it was pretty darn convenient to have uh, an in-house food photographer because um, mm. I, could, I would be making one of these recipes, we'd set it up, I'd be chopping, and he'd be, you know, uh, photographing while I'm working and setting up these vignettes and scenes. And then um, we would cook it and serve it up, and he'd take more pictures, and then we'd eat a delicious dinner. So it was really pretty convenient, I have to say. Wow. I love this. And I want to give a shout-out to stylist Emma Kingsley, too, because she's the co-founder of Lady Farmer. And so she's doing, you know, sustainable clothing, right? So that's another huge part of this. 
Um, you know, and, and Ellen, that's something you know about as well, is the weaving part. Yeah. The, pardon? I said weave, the, weaving uh, and, and, and the textile weaving part. Art. Oh, right. Yeah, it's all a piece. That's what I think is so cool. We are, all of these things are so connected and in, in, integral, and, and, um, and the lady farmers um, are hoping to vertically integrate their business by growing um, flax and hemp and other fibers here in the reserve and then being able to make sustainable clothing made out of, you know, um, organically grown uh, and locally wow. sewn and fair, cool. you know, with a, uh, paying a fair wage to the people that are making the clothing and clothing that lasts. And, um, and then I'm working on repurposing things that, you know, how do we mend and care for our clothing and, um, yeah. and so that we'd waste very little of it and that it's sustainable. So I got intrigued by the idea of, of course, fibers, um, from Langstaff Farms and other farms um, to make wool and rag rugs by repurposing um, people's clothing and uh, and even things like the baling twine that uh, comes off the hay. There's a big equestrian um, community here, and um, so you imagine you can imagine there's copious amounts of all kinds of fiber uh, being being utilized out here. And I wonder if there were inventive ways to repurpose it as well to try and mm. kind of uh, keep those connections and the um, and anything that would be considered waste. Um, actually is another person's treasure, potentially. So right. well, and we yeah, even we talk are. about, you know, the dis- yeah, the distillers who, who you know, take the what remains from the work that they do and, and give it back at the mash to, um, to farm animals to consume so that, so that we think about um, the, you know, root to tip, nose to tail, um, mm-hmm. that, that to land, you know, that whole, that whole cycle. It's cool to get rid of this, this thing that we're in, the cycle of throwaway. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, if something's a little bit worn or if something broke, you know, don't repair it, throw it out, get a new one. I mean, it's, it's like the fast food. Yeah. It's, and then so the, even like when you're talking about furniture, you know, that now you get all like furniture made from particle board and it is going to break and you are going to throw it away unless you invest in real furniture that if it does break, which is rare, you fix it because it's mm-hmm. worth it. And it's got a story. Yeah. It's got a story. Yeah. 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 That's, what, like that's story another beauty about your book is everything is a story in here. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and we were glad to be able to link that, you know, because I think it does make it more interesting. It's like a little bit of extra salt on the, on the, on the, on the dish. Mm. You and know, and, with, and yeah. go ahead, go ahead, Ellen. Oh, I was just going to say what what comes to mind is the community, the sense of community. Um, when during lambing, you know, the the mm-hmm. different uh, some of the different farmers and they're in the they're in the middle of the night and it's cold and they have an issue, you know, with one of their um, their sheep's giving birth and they call another farmer and say, hey, can you help out? And they're right there um, assisting each other. So there's this very um, strong and vibrant web and fabric. Uh, of a community here where they help each other and trade knowledge and um cool. and it's yeah it's inspiring mm. cool i i love that see that's the thing back in the day you know there was you know the the barn raising and everybody would go mm-hmm. in and help and, and help, yeah. you know help mm-hmm. each other harvest and and i think that can help happen more when everybody's doing something different that they and even you know they can help each other when they're in a similar um enterprise but um by having such diversity, it gives, you know, year round. It, it's it's easier on the land to have this breathing space. I, I can't explain it, but when mm-hmm. you do different crops, you've got something going on every different season, and so everyone can help each other. Like if you're growing mm-hmm. grapes, you can help your your neighbor because your harvesting time is different. Well, I think it protects the soil right. from using only two or three nutrients and draining them yeah. completely. This is just so cool. Yeah, cool. I do want to tell you, you know, we don't, we, I mean, we're on the road. And so traveling and food, it's, it's actually, it's the, everybody goes, oh, cool, you're going to eat everywhere. Well, you know, you can't. <laughs> you can't. And it's, a, it's, a, it's the hardest thing, actually. And sometimes you end up in food deserts and places that actually are places that shouldn't be food deserts are food deserts. You, it would blow your it's mind. Odd. Um, but I, I want to say, you know, 
going through your book, I'm like, okay, suddenly I want to skill it. I want to start cooking. Yes. <laughs> suddenly I'm like, you know, that's like, get over it, Lisa. You can't cook. But it makes me want to cook <laughs> and try things. You know, you, I'm like, oh, I never thought of, you know, putting these two ingredients together. I didn't think of, you know, parsnips being used in cake. I had no idea about that. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all these different things. But um, the aioli, and the way that photo, I was like, oh, my gosh, of all those different vegetables, now I'm like, that's how we can eat across the country. Yeah, we could. How hard that's is it for us to make idea. aioli in our hotel rooms? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't tell anybody. You could. Yeah. <laughs> we could. A little garlic, a little mayonnaise, you're all set. Hit the farm yeah. market, you're good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You go to the local farmer's market, and yeah. then you just dip and, yeah. and bite. I like this. Cool. Yeah, you gave me some good <laughs> ideas, even for road people, oh, you know. Yeah, well, oh, thank good. you so much, both of you, and, and hopefully we'll meet you when we get to your neck of the of the woods or the reserve, I should oh. say. Definitely on the list, you know, especially uh, being part of the National Park Service. That's how Absolutely. our whole tour started was to document all the national park units in the country. Then we realized we'd been to over 100 parks, and uh, a lot of them were the smaller community parks and state parks, and that all of them matter. So we're doing all of them. So the reserve is on the list. <laughs> so because I look Excellent. at that as a giant we'll park. We'll be here. We'll be here awesome. waiting for you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both, uh, Claudia and Ellen. Everyone, uh, the book again is Bread and Beauty: A Year in Montgomery County's Agricultural Reserve. You can go to the website breadandbeauty.org, and again, uh, the net proceeds uh, benefit the Alliance. The uh, Montgomery Countryside Alliance and the Mana Food Center. And before you go, actually, Ellen, I want to give everyone a little insight into the Mana Food Center. Yeah, they're the um, county's food bank. So they, um, you know, they collect and distribute um, uh, food to county residents. They do. Um, they have a food truck called Manny, and they go around and teach cooking classes and nutrition classes. And they're just a, cool. an incredible resource. Awesome. 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 Thanks. Everyone, again, breadandbeauty.org. We also want to thank uh, today's sponsor, which is the Peanut Patch here in Yuma, Arizona. And uh, they have got over years and years of agricultural history. They even give tours and explain how peanuts are grown, which they used to be grown here in Yuma. However, Yuma, a lot of people know it, this area for their winter crops. One thing that is very unique is that they grow Royal Medjool dates here in this region, and uh, the Peanut Patch is the uh, retail distributor for a uh, Bard Date Company, and, and basically they grow organically because there's no pest for these uh, crops here, and they're delicious, they're nutritious, they're better than candy bars, talk about fast food. <laughs> so you can check it out. Go to BardDate.com. You can order them online. And uh, we've got a song for you both. Um, because, you know, we just feel like this is just a fun song. It's called Ham and Eggs. <laughs> this is from our friends, uh, the band Blind Lemon Pledge, and it's from their latest album, Evangeline, and you can go to blindlemon-pledge.com. So here it is, Ham and Eggs. Take care, ladies. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Found a dollar in an old pink coat I wore for a long, long time I couldn't have come at a better mall Cause I was down to one thing die I marched my dollar and that dime Down to Big Bill's Diner Cause when you tie your feet back on There ain't no diner finer Old Big Bill was waiting for me by the kitchen door He takes my coat And my poor pie hat And says I know what you're here for Ham and eggs And a flapjack stack Ham and eggs And a flapjack stack Ham and eggs And a flapjack stack And red eye gravy all over If I was a pharaoh with a half a million slaves I'd abdicate my crown and throne For a plate of big bills eggs Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack And red eye gravy all over Waiting for me 
the kitchen door He took my coat and my pork pie hat And says, I know what you're here for Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack And red eye gravy all over If I was elected Pope I'd wear them satin slippers Just one stack of Bill's flapjacks And I'd win one for the gipper Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack And red eye gravy all over Ham and eggs and a flapjack stack And 